Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll call the meeting to order. Will be given at the start of the Please rise and pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Hill, roll call, please. Mr. Balka? Here. Mrs. Bacco? Here. Mr. Bashada? Present. Mrs. Bloom? Here. Mr. Callahan? Here. Mr. Esposito? Here. Ms. Rubio? Here. Mr. Walsh? Here. Mr. Sayak? Here. Can I have a motion for executive, please? So moved. By Mrs. Bloom, do I have a second by Mr. Bashad? Whereas Section 8 of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, permits the exclusion of the public from a meeting in certain circumstances. And whereas this public body is of the opinion that such circumstances presently exist. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Education of the Borough of Sayreville, County of Middlesex, State of New Jersey, as follows. The public shall be excluded from discussion of and action upon the here and after specified subject matters. The general nature of the subject matter to be discussed is as follows. Personnel, including but not limited to agenda items, negotiations for the SCA, and security. It is anticipated at this time that the above stated subject matter shall be made public at such time as the need for non-disclosure no longer exists. This resolution shall take effect immediately. Mr. Balka? Yes. Mrs. Bacco? Yes. Mr. Pashada? Yes. Mrs. Bloom? Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Rubio? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Sayak? Yes. Okay, our meeting will resume at 7.30. Thank you very much. Order. Good evening and welcome to the May 15th meeting of the Serval Board of Ed. Take notice this public meeting of the Serval Board of Ed was transmitted to the Home News Tri Tribune the Star Ledger in accordance with Chapter 231, Public Law 1875. Further, in accordance with NJSA 10 colon 4 6 21, a copy was posted outside the Secretary's office and also filed with the Clerk of the Borough of Serval. Please rise, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the end of this month, we celebrate a very important holiday, Memorial Day. Memorial Day is celebrated in honor of all of those who paid the supreme sacrifice for the freedom that we so richly enjoy in this country, for the freedom of a public education, and for all of the freedoms that we are so blessed to have in the United States of America. I'd like to take a moment and have a moment of silence to honor those who paid that price and gave their lives for the freedom that we enjoy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now, before we have our Pledge of Allegiance, it's my pleasure to introduce the Cerebral War Memorial High School Band under the leadership of Dr. Paul Caruso, who will lead off with our national anthem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you'll please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated.
<laughs> Ms. Hill, roll call, please. Mr. Balka? Here. Mrs. Batko? Here. Mr. Bashada? Present. Mrs. Bloom? Here. Mr. Callahan? Here. Mr. Esposito? Here. Ms. Rubio? Here. Mr. Walsh? Here. Mr. Syak? Here. Could you please summarize our executive session items? The board discussed personnel, including but not limited to agenda items, negotiations for the SCA, and security matters. Thank you very much. Uh, our student council representative is unable to be here today, so we'll move on to our presentations. The Board of Education wanted to take an opportunity. We received so many uh, accolades via email from our art department in terms of the accomplishments of our wonderful students at all level in the area of the arts. And in speaking with our art teachers last year, several of them indicated to me that one of the reasons they send the emails to the board is because they wanted the arts to have the same visibility as so many of the other wonderful programs that we have in the several public schools. And oftentimes when it comes to like a sports championship or an Odyssey of the Mind championship or um, you know, an extracurricular FBLA championship, they get honored at a board meeting, but there really isn't the same visibility for the uh, fine and practical arts. Arts. So uh, I had a long list of emails and I was going to send out my customary congratulatory letters at the end of the year and then I said to Dr. Labby, why don't we turn our board meeting into an art gallery and let's properly recognize the uh, contributions and the outstanding talent of all of our students uh, who are involved in the arts at a board meeting. So next door, you've got a art gallery, which we invite you to visit if you haven't already. We also have some refreshments, which we uh, also invite you to enjoy. And here to speak about the arts is someone who is uh, a resident district expert in the arts, Mrs. Lucy Bloom. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if you don't know, I taught art in the high school for 17 years. I have been blessed with talent, and it still inspires me to see the talent of our young students. So tonight, we are going to honor them, and we have some certificates. Ms. Charmello, if you will join me. This is Lascala's class. Kaiwai, is that right? Lucas? Kawai Lucas, uh, whose ceramic tree mug received second place for the three dimensional category for the Sayerville Shade Tree Commission <coughs> Art Contest. Ceramic Vase, she received third place in the three-dimensional category for the Sayerville Shade Tree Commission Contest. <laughs> Next is from Mr. Mergner's class, Tisha Madhock, great artist and will promote our school in many more contests in the future. Most recently, a fellow student and her won first place in a contest for painting of a tree. very passionate artist that tries her best at everything she does. She most recently won first place in a class contest with a fellow student. <laughs> Ciara Weller is a great artist that loves trying different mediums and techniques to do her work. She most recently won first place in a contest for one of her paintings. Next is from Ms. Moisich's class, Jar Velez, advanced art student who received first place in the three-dimensional category for his tunnel book at the Sayreville Shade Tree Commission Art Competition. <laughs> Rachel Chanowitz, Jewelry One student who received a gold key award for her pendant and an honorable mention for her tunnel book through the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, Rachel's pendant was on display at the Montclair Art Museum for a month. <laughs> Katrin Macaretz, advanced art student, 
had her artwork included in postcards from the edge and exhibition at Sikkim Jenkins Gallery in New York City. <laughs> Christian Brito, advanced art student, had his charcoal drawing chosen for an exhibition at the Rutgers University Camden Art Gallery. <laughs> Rachel Chanowitz, Jar Velez, Christian Brito, and Paulina Litz their work was selected to be included in an exhibition at the gallery at Peters Valley School of Craft Art Gallery. <laughs> Simona Adu, Yvette Anning, Tracy Asser, Jaheem Barnes Jackson, Christian Brito, John Googler, Paulina Letts, Katrin Macaretz, Stephen Ramos, Ricardo Rodriguez, Callie Strohmenger, Yeli Touré, Jar Velez, Amanda Walenti. These advanced art students were invited to create intaglio prints and homemade paper at the Brodsky Center at Rutgers University through their educational outreach program. Students created dry point etchings with the master printer and paper with the master paper paper maker. And from the class of Mr. Rice and Mrs. Charmello, Caitlin Gorick won a holiday greeting card competition for the New Jersey School Boards Association. And I believe I actually got one of those cards from Mr. Syak. Now you know when I was teaching, I only called them by their first names. Do we have students here that are going to uh, going to give the awards to, or are you just going to give them to their teachers? Ah, okay. Can we get them to stand? Come on, art students. If yeah, why don't we have them all come up front, up. and uh, we'll do a photo. Anybody else hiding out there? Go on. No. Stand in the back, Andrew. It's okay. No, I said Andrew should stand in the back. <laughs> you can't hide too far back. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for coming out for the support. Um, we have a lot of students um, in the ninth and 10th grade class coming up that have a ton of talent. Um, and we really look forward to seeing what they have and saying farewell, farewell to our seniors is always hard. We have a lot of talented students here in Cerville and it's a great program to teach. Thank you for honoring us. Dr. Labby, uh, Teachers of the Year, I believe, are next. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sayek. Um, as everyone knows, May is the month in which um, we pay particular recognition to the amazing professionals working in education. However, as far as I'm concerned, every day, every week, every month should be Educator Appreciation Day. However, May is and has always been officially dubbed Educator Appreciation Month. 
Last week, we just celebrated Teacher Appreciation Week, uh, a Teacher Appreciation Day, and our Nurses Appreciation Day. Today, we want to pay special recognition and celebrate the incredible individuals that are in this room this evening. However, we also don't want to forget the, our, the amazing staff we have here in Sayreville. As everyone knows, when you talk about education, the number one factor in education is the effectiveness of the teachers, the support staff, workers that provide services to our students, as well as the support staff workers that do everything to help make sure our teachers get everything they need. And in Sayreville, it's my opinion that we have the absolute best and that there is no one that can compete with the teachers, our educational services providers, and our educational support staff here. Tonight, we are going to honor those selected as being teachers of the year, educational services providers of the year, and educational support professionals of the year. And to assist me in doing so, I'm going to ask a Board of Education member, as well as the principal from that school, and other administrators who wish to join us in identifying, honoring, and most importantly, celebrating these truly amazing professionals who dedicate day in and day out for one cause, and that's to promote the success of every student that they work with or that they come in contact with. To begin this, I'd like to ask Mrs. Coglianese and Mrs. Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Rubio to come join me up front. I know, I'm staring. I've never seen you speechless before. <laughs> Uh, at this time, I'd like to call up Laura Hornline, who is our Teacher of the Year. Uh, Ms. Hornline is an inspiration to many. Uh, she motivates. She is the cheerleader. Uh, as you can see, she greets every child and staff member in our building with a warm and friendly hello. Your classroom is magical, uh, and we thank you for everything that you do for the children, their families, your colleagues, and your administrators. We're so proud of you, Laura. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Alex DeSico, our Child Study Team Member, Educational Services Professional of the Year. <laughs> As Mrs. Rubio just said, another goodie, and you're right. Alex, uh, what you do for your students, uh, the teachers, it's just amazing. You're reliable, you're consistent. Uh, if you don't know an answer, you go find it, you come back. Uh, the way that you have served our terrible community and the SUS students, we are very thankful and very proud to call you RESP. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask David and Audrey if they could just step up here too. Ms. Burns, if you wouldn't. For the next person, uh, we would like to recognize Miss Beth DeMeo. So I've been extremely fortunate over the years to work with many, many dedicated uh, child study team members and related service providers, but uh, Beth is truly amazing. If you uh, want to keep up with Beth, you need roller skates. Um, particularly because she's a long distance marathon runner, she really is, but she has the uh, amazing ability to service all of our physical therapy needs throughout the entire district, um, almost single-handedly, so we really applaud her for her dedication. Um, uh, if you've sat with Beth in, in an IEP meeting, you will see that she is able to break down uh, some pretty complicated and complex medical terms into language that we can all understand as we service the uh, most medically fragile children in the district uh, with Beth's assistance. So, Beth, you're wonderful. Uh, 
Um, and the final person we just like to recognize is um, a former power professional. She has changed careers recently. Uh, that is Samantha Atardi. I don't know if Samantha's not here. Um, Samantha dedicated her life for many, many years uh, to some of our most disabled children in the district. Uh, she was a mom, a sister, a friend uh, to many of the students, but also to her colleagues. Uh, she was a true definition of, of team player. So Samantha, if you're watching this, congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Rubio and Mrs. Coglinis. I know she has to go back to SAMHSA. They have a concert this evening. Uh, and now for the high school, I'm going to ask that Mrs. Bloom, as well as our high school administration, come on up and join me. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for um, coming out tonight. On behalf of Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Rubino, myself, and Ms. Romero, we're going to start with Ms. Snappy. Um, Ms. Snappy is part of the math department. Mala, if you'd like to come up, come on up. Um, she is a fabulous young individual that's very organized, very into her students and what she does for, for the kids of our school. She's very involved in everything from uh, student council or, or class council to helping out in the office with administration uh, and, and, her, and our duties. She works with the attendance department. She does a lot of different things. But the most unique part of Miss Nappy, which I love greatly, is one, her attitude, but her classroom. It's absolutely amazing. We um, decided this year to go with something called uh, flex seating. And she has entirely transformed her classroom into all on her own. I'm going to say her fiance helped out a little bit too. Um, into something called flex seating where students walk in and they choose a seat that they want to sit in. But it's not the normal desk anymore. It's And correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't been in a couple weeks. But it's a beanbag chair or a tire with a, a pillow on it um, painted in, in uh, different colors. Uh, and they get to choose a seat every day, correct? Every day they get to choose their own seat. So attendance is absolutely fantastic. Everybody wants to get the best seat in the house. But besides that, she is an absolute great, great teacher. She knows what she's doing in terms of technology, mathematics, and someone that we can ultimately um, have work for us and our kids every single day. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> Miss Nappy, Teacher of the Year. Okay, next, uh, Ms. Hartnett, Kristen Hartnett, come on up. All right, I'm going to say my, my, uh, our two cents. Um, Kristen in, in the child study team uh, is absolutely one of the leaders. I'm sorry. I, I do that a lot so they can hear me. Um, one of our child study team members, uh, absolutely phenomenal in what you do. Uh, most recently, we worked together on a number of cases, um, and she has this big, enormous heart. Absolutely have this big, big enormous heart. And she deserves to be, um, and uh, get the award tonight. Mr. Um, so, <laughs> Mr. Gulhusky noticed, mentioned um, Kristen's giant heart. Um, if you have a chance to work with Kristen at the high school, you will know that she is a fierce, fierce advocate for children who need a loving but firm nudge toward independence as she helps our, our um, young adults to transition into adult living. We've had many spirited conversations over what's necessary, um, and we can count on Kristen to make sure that she prepares our kids for post-high school life. Kristen, you're, you're a breath of fresh air at the high school, and we really appreciate you. Thank you. 
And last, our ESP of the year is Mrs. Will Dolchek, Patty, our secretary in the main office, uh, Mr. Brown's uh, principal secretary, as well as she sits right out the side the door of my office. Um, she's the most kind person in the world. Uh, works extremely hard at what she does and very adamant about every task that she takes um, every day. Okay, she ultimately has been around for I think it's 16 years, approximately 16 years. I think it is maybe 14. Okay, and she uh, is on time every day. She ultimately has a great, great work ethic, which I absolutely love because she does a lot of good stuff for me. And uh, Ms. Romero and Mr. Rubino, but thank you, Patty, for everything that you've done. And um, I wish she could be here, but she's not. On behalf of Mr. Brown and uh, the administrative team, thank you to all of you. You guys are awesome. You are. Thank you, Mr. Glahusky. <laughs> Jimmy, you got anything for this? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you, Mr. Glahusky, and thank you to our high school administrators. Um, now, to help me with the middle school, I'm going to ask Mr. Esposito and Ms. Jakubic, as well as the middle school administration that's here, to help us recognize, honor, and celebrate our middle school educators of the year. Ms. Jakubic? Good evening. Our Governor's Teacher of the Year is Mrs. Margaret Fallon. Mrs. Fallon, please come up. <laughs> Margaret doesn't like public attention, so keep coming. Mrs. Fallon is an amazing educator and an amazing person. When you hear the phrase, when people hear the phrase, teaching children, not content, that's Mrs. Fallon. Every moment in her class is a teachable moment. From mummifying raw chicken <laughs> um, to the life-size sarcophagi, as well as the community service club, the class act committee, and the countless hours she spends soliciting donations for foster children in Middlesex County. Margaret is a leading by example at all times to all of her children. And when some parents have some concerns about their sixth grader coming up, and they say, oh, my child's very nervous about coming to the middle school, one of my first responses is, don't, rather, don't worry, I'll put them in Mrs. Fallon's homeroom. They'll be fine. So she's an absolutely amazing educator. Next, we have Mr. David Fisher, the Educational um, Services Professional of the Year. He wasn't sure if he could be here this evening or not, so I don't think he is here. Um, Mr. Fisher started off in our district in 2005 as the counselor for our, what, a newly implanted a program, the Achieve program at that time. Um, with that program changing into a special education program, Mr. Fisher then moved into the role as a regular guidance counselor. Um, and that was a big difference for Mr. Fisher. It was a change. And um, he's done a dynamite job, and he's absolutely terrific and a great asset to our school. So we thank Mr. Fisher very much. And then we have Mrs. Maria Basile. She is our educational support specialist. Please come on up. No, educational service. Excuse me, educational services specialist. Ms. Basile has been in the middle school cafeteria since 1996. Um, and whenever we have special days and when things need to be made for the faculty, Mrs. Basile is right there. That's when, if you remember um, Mr. Malara and Mr. Malara, they used to run down the hallway to get to the recipe that Mrs. Basile made. In addition to her contribution to the cafeteria, she's also made a contribution to our staff at large at the middle school. Um, Mrs. Basile has two daughters and a son, and one of her daughters is now the, um, one of the guidance counselors at Saraville Middle School, Ms. Antoinette Basile. So we thank you very much for raising such a wonderful young lady who's such a great asset to our school. So thank you. Go 
Shut up. Come on up, David. <laughs> And to help us recognize and honor our amazing educators from the Arleth Elementary School, I'm going to ask Mr. Syak and Mr. Preston to join me. Good afternoon. Uh, we're very, very fortunate at Orlet to have some incredibly talented and dedicated uh, people here, and I'd like to introduce to you a couple of them right now. First, we'll start with our Educator of the Year, Mr. Zorner. He runs our music program. He has really taken the program to the next level. He has a course program in the morning with over 90 students, and uh, he is now traveling. He's on his world tour. Um, we go to about five different locations singing for senior citizens, and he's going to Somerset Patriot Stadium and a couple other venues on his world tour. But he does a fantastic job with the music program, both with the chorus and some instrumentals. So thank you, Mr. Zorner. <laughs> Next, we have Mrs. H, one of our wonderful, amazing paraprofessionals. She currently is working in one of our kindergarten MD rooms and just does an amazing job dedicating her time to support our students, giving them all the need and help that, uh, help that they need. So thank you, Mrs. H, for all your tireless and, and selfish efforts supporting our students. And next, Mrs. Schleyline, who's one of our child study team members, who once again, is just such an incredible advocate for the students at Orleth and is always helping to support them, always working uh, for them, visiting their classroom, making sure they have everything they need, and is also just always there whenever you have a question or need a helping hand. So thank you. And to help us celebrate and recognize our incredible educators from the Eisenhower Elementary School, I ask Mr. Nuremberger and Mrs. Backo to join me up front. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, the Educator of the Year for Eisenhower, Ms. Cindy Good. Uh, Mrs. Good is not only a fantastic teacher, but she's an amazing colleague as well. She uh, collaborates with all of our staff, shares ideas, uh, is the first person to offer help. She really is a, a huge part to our family, so we're, we're really lucky to have her. If you walk by her classroom, all of her kids are engaged in meaningful learning. But what impresses me most about Ms. Good is that they're all, they all have a smile on their face every day. So we are so fortunate to have you, and congratulations. Our next honoree is uh, Ms. Regina Howard. I don't believe she was able to be here tonight. She is our academic support instructor. Um, she has quickly left a mark um, in our school as just an amazing resource for not only our students in teaching and reading, but for all of our staff. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot personally from her as well. Just, again, an amazing resource, uh, an amazing person. So we're very lucky to have her. 
And our last honoree is Ms. Linda Kudrick, um, who we had the fortunate pleasure of working with um, as a secretary in our building for many, many years. Uh, always had a smile on her face, greeted our families and, and children uh, with warmth, and she is sorely missed at this point. Uh, she retired in uh, December. Uh, so I'm uh, honored to present that to you. Congratulations. And to recognize our amazing educators from the Truman Elementary School, I'd like to ask Mr. Callahan, who's making his way up here right now, as well as Mr. Byrne, to join us up front. Do I, ha Do I have a uh, half hour? This evening, uh, we only have one honoree from Truman School here, so I can take all my time to mention all the qualities of this one individual. Uh, in the Truman tradition, she is certainly the quintessential educator. Um, that's uh, Mrs. Irene Werner. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of enthusiasm at Truman, um, and so Irene is a member of our skip committee. So when we sit and we talk about different things that are involving Truman, uh, I have to uh, really restrain uh, verbally uh, Irene from just saying yes to all the different things we want to do because she wants to take them all on. Uh, because that's, that symbolizes her, her dedication to Truman. Um, she is a person who um, I mean, is evidenced by with the fact that we even have children from her, uh, from her class and parents from her class here this night because that's the kind of impact she makes uh, upon her children. And uh, as because of the fact we're re honoring her this evening, um, we are just transporting that to the entire school. Um, and so we are indeed blessed uh, with so many wonderful people at Truman. And Irene has the opportunity tonight to represent them all and for our distinct honor to be able to um, single you out this year um, for all you do for us. Um, which even in my mind, can, in my words, leaves me speechless uh, in, in terms of what you do. And we're very grateful um, because of just, again, you're just so compassionate, so caring, um, so full of energy and life, so interested in the children, uh, so concerned about their well-being, whether it be in terms of their academics, whether it be in terms of their uh, social-emotional development. And we just can't say enough. Um, but that's what you do every day. And this one small measure of just uh, public appreciation, I hope that you would take into your heart and to uh, warm it um, and bring that back to everybody else at Truman School as well. So thank you very much, Irene. Okay? Okay. And to celebrate the wonderful teachers from the Wilson Elementary School, I'd like to ask Ms. Davis, as well as Mr. Walsh, to join me up front. How's everybody tonight? This is beautiful. I, this is so wonderful when we celebrate people. We're not complaining. We're not talking about not having a good day or the rain or it's too hot. We're talking about some wonderful people. I have three wonderful people who it just gives me honor and pleasure to introduce to you. The first one is Mr. Daniel Toy. He's our Teacher of the Year. Dan is awesome. He's always there. He's there early. He's there for the children. He's an advocate for our children. He's committed um, to our building to our teachers, he's a mentor. He doesn't like people to talk too much about him, but he's absolutely awesome. I call him the man in the house because we have so many boys that we're trying to raise at school, and I think he does an outstanding job with that. 
and I know he'll miss them as they move on because he's a third grade teacher. I know he will miss them as they go on to the UES, and I believe he's done so much to mold them and shape them into gentlemen and ladies, preparing them for that upper elementary school. So Dan, I appreciate you. I thank you publicly for all the things that you've done for our building, for our teachers, our new teachers, mentoring them. Um, congratulations to you. I'm proud of you. I'm so excited. The second member of our family is Miss Pamela Schleck. Mrs. Schleck is our ASI teacher. She works with RTI. You can go with RTI. <laughs> she could tell you too. Uh, definitely an advocate for the children. Um, Pam is um, she is our uh, bus monitor. There are so many things that. Great job. <laughs> she loves it. She's uh, created a wonderful template for her children so that they can make good choices on the bus. Um, she's been known to ride a bus, and I've gotten loads of phone calls. Why is a teacher riding on the bus? It's fun. So <laughs> they're very quiet. <laughs> so it, it's a wonderful experience to have um, Pam in our family. She does so much, always that extra, never says no, skip committee. Um, school Improvement Committee, a uh, critical friend to the principal. And you know, as principals, we always need to be surrounded by critical friends and people that help us and shape us and tell us what's broken and what needs to be fixed. Um, congratulations to you, and I'm proud of you. I'm honored to be here to, to speak about you. I, I wrote everything down on the cell phone, but I knew I couldn't stand up with the cell phone because my colleagues didn't, so I put it in my pocketbook. But Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Our third member is a paraprofessional. She is an absolutely wonderful person. I've learned so much from her. This is Marlene Lewandowski. <laughs> so first day on the job, come right over. First day on the job and I stand outside. I want to meet everyone. I want to see the children, the families. Here's Marlene. Oh, hi, John. Hi. Hi. How's the family? How are the children? Mary, don't forget your... She knew every single person coming to the school, every father, every grandparent. And I thought, you know what? I could really learn a lot from this lady. And I have. Wonderful. Such an advocate for the children. And that's really what it's all about, children first. I love your children first attitude. I love the fact that you mentor other paras. I love the fact that you help support teachers. And I love the fact that you support me. I love the fact that you're in our building. And I want to thank you. I'm so honored and privileged to be able to speak on behalf of you because I know you will continue to be a lifelong learner. And if you're not sure how to have playtime, you want to ask this lady here. She's been trained in PlayWorks, and she knows how to teach people how to play. David, get in there. We got a board meeting we got to do. <laughs> and I'd like to ask Mr. Balka to assist me with um, our, our final educator that we'd like to celebrate and honor today. Um, but before I call this person up, um, you know, as a superintendent, I get a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails um, from our, 
our clients, our parents. And you can imagine that a great majority of them may not be very positive. However, I tend to collect the positive ones. And, you know, at the beginning of the year, as beginning of every year, we, we have these difficulties. Um, every year starts off with some wrinkles with regard to transportation. And uh, this year, probably more wrinkles than we've had in the past. Um, and, I, and I had many, many emails and many, many phone calls um, from our clients who weren't very happy with the services they were getting. And there were times where I, I felt like I was going to go crazy, but then every once in a while, I would get this amazing feedback from a parent with regard to one of our bus drivers. And the same name kept popping up and popping up and popping up. How this one particular bus driver knows all the students on her bus, is always on time, is always personable with the parents at the bus stop, and demonstrates day in and day out how much pride she takes in the importance of her role in this district, and how much she truly loves and adores the children that she serves so well. So it's our pleasure to introduce to you the Transportation Education Support Professional of the Year, Joanne Leone. She's not here? And Joanne is not here, but we'll be glad to get her that. God bless her and all of our bus drivers. And we thank one more time all of our amazing educators in this district, and they truly are the absolute best as far as I'm concerned, as far as this board's concerned, as far as our parents and our students are concerned. We have the absolute best here in Sayreville. And the shining stars that are here tonight clearly reflect the excellence that makes up this wonderful dis district. So to all of our educators of the year, thank you so much for the way you have always represented our district. And thank you for everything you do every single day for all of our students. You all rock. You are all amazing. Thank you very much. to join our uh, teachers and ESPs in a year as well for a photo. We'll need a wide lens for all of us, but... Uh
So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Good meeting, good meeting. Sorry. I recommend we take like a 15 minute break, that way everyone can enjoy. Yeah, we'll give them a few minutes before we start. Yeah. Join the Coffee, cookies, please help yourself. Even the go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I noticed that, yes. Jimmy hit the lights. <laughs> All right, so we will proceed with our uh, regularly scheduled agenda. Uh, we have the correspondence items that are listed there, and then we have approval of minutes, the minutes of the regular and executive session. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? By Mrs. Rubio, do I have a second? Second. By Mr. Bichotta. Any comments or corrections on the minutes? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Mr. Balka? Yes. Mrs. Bacco? Yes. Mr. Bichotta? Yes. Mrs. Bloom? Yes. Mr. Callahan? He's, I didn't realize he's not back yet. <laughs> uh, Mr. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Rubio? Yes. Mr. Walsh? Yes. And Mr. Syak? Yes. Okay, we're moving on to our uh, superintendent's report, although there are no district highlights. Do you have district highlights or no? No, not today. Okay, Dr. Labby, your superintendent's report. Thank you, Mr. Syak. If I could direct everyone's attention to Vision 2030 Finance and Infrastructure. Among the most important items, uh, number 12, we're asking you to approve a resolution to pay the Spiesel Architectural Group $66,000 for the development of a district-wide master plan assessment. Um, you know, we had spoken at our last meeting about the potential of going out for a referendum. Well, in order to do that, we need them to do a com comprehensive assessment of all of our facilities as well as our, in our infrastructure. Was that budgeted or? No. It's not in the capital reserve. It's not budgeted. Numbers 13 through 16, which can be found on page 3 and 4, uh, we're asking you to approve medical, prescription, and dental health benefits renewal rates for the 2018-19 school year. Number 25, uh, we're asking you to approve several facility usage permits, some with fees in accordance with the facility usage fee schedule. Um, you can find that as those on pages 6 and 8, but I want to bring to your attention the Liquid Church. Um, we have just um, have a permit there we're asking you to approve which could generate approximately $151,000 in revenue for us next year. Numbers 31 and 32, we're asking to accept the proposal submitted by Shaw Sports Turf for the turf field replacement at the high school. It's through um, the Ed Services uh, Commission of New Jersey via the Sp uh, Shaw Sports Turf uh, Field Direct Purchasing Program. It's at a cost of $407,234. However, we're asking you to withdraw capital from Capital Reserve $419,234 uh, because we'll have some other related engineering services that will be included in that. And finally, uh, we're asking you um, to approve, um, er, er, to accept the bids contained in bid 2018-19 number two for the 2018-19 single student transportation routes. If you remember from our last meeting, we rejected those bids. Miss Hill, uh, and you gave Miss Hill authority to rebid them, and this time, lo and behold, our bids came in at a reasonable cost. I apologize, I have the wrong um, items number on my slide, but um, those are on the addendum. Can you? Uh, it's okay. We can't see the slide anyway, so you're oh. good. <laughs> Any questions, Mrs. Backup? Yes. 
How did you know I was going to have a question? Because you started. You started speaking. <laughs> we have, I have no, ESPN. I, I have ESPN. Huh? Anyway. Uh, I have ESPN. Could you go, um, were there other bidders for the turf field, and yes. why did you pick Shaw? So we received quotes from um, Hellas Construction. Uh, they were significantly more expensive. They came in at about five hundred and thirty-seven thousand uh, dollars. After we received those, we kind of and it wasn't a bid; it was quotes through the Ed Services Commission. Uh, so we could kind of move forward. We're working with uh, the Finance Committee, and then at that point, maybe three weeks after I had given a deadline for submitting proposals, we got a quote from Field Turf. Um, but their quote was comparable to Shaw, it wasn't really any additional cost savings, and it was for a different kind of turf. So the turf that Shaw has proposed is more of a combination turf, so it's good for football as well as for things like soccer and field hockey. So is the turf that Shaw is providing different than the turf we have now? Uh, most likely. Uh, it's been a number of years, so things have kind of developed in that time period. Um, it's There's monofilament and then there's Another, I think it's called slit filament, and then there's a combination. So this is a combination. So some of it stands up, some of it lays flat, so it's good for multiple different sports. But the field we have now, that was for multiple sports, was it not? Is there, like, that's what I was looking for. Is there a distinction? I'm not sports? sure, and it, I, from my understanding, turf has changed significantly since we put that in, so I imagine it would be at least slightly different. But I don't know exactly in which direction, so I'm not sure what to look for for that. The greatest difference um, from the turf that you, you purchased years ago in this is the filler um, as well as the paint. It's and as what? The paint. Yeah. Is it still going to be those little black things that get all over? Or Yeah, it's so, still yeah. the filler, but it's not, I believe it's not, the, I think it's a mixture. And if Mr. Coleman'sberger has any more information on that. It's not the tire. Um, it's not completely a mixture of tire um, shavings. The filler, it, I believe it's I want to say cork and, and some other types of materials, which are far safer than the old filler. And is there going to be maintenance on it that we have to do? Or the, the same, same maintenance that we've been doing. That we've been the doing. fluffing. Fluffing? Fluffing. Fluffing. It's a technical term. Fluffing. We all like fluffing. fluffing. And for uh, page four, number 14, for the prescription coverage rates, those are the, I assume, the rates that we discussed uh, a couple meetings ago. Those are the 5% lower yes. rates. Um, consistent with that meeting, I'm going to vote no because I expect the, the, the rates to be lower. <coughs> okay. Dr. Levy, I have a question on transportation. Okay. Uh, with these bids that went out, when bid specs came in, are there any adjustments for the cost of fuel in these transportation bids or just a straight bid? It's just a straight bid. So the in other only words, thing would be if we change the route drastically, then there is some off-road mileage, but we don't typically do that. See, the reason I ask that is because everyone's well aware that the price of fuel is continuously going up. <coughs> right. And if we can lock these people into what the rates were without an adjustment, it may be beneficial to the district. Yeah. And just for clarification points, that is item number 33 on the addendum. Any other questions or comments on finance and infrastructure? Number 14, I'm also voting no on. And I'm going to vote uh, no on number 14 as well. And Dr. Labby, I'll just offer some uh, some comments on number 14. Um, obviously, the board disagrees um, or is having difficulty reaching consensus with regards to the uh, percentage increase that we're expect or percentage decrease actually that we would be expecting with regard to the prescription plan. And I think part of that function is is whether or not you, when you look at the numbers, are more conservative or you know more optimistic in terms of looking at the data and looking at the assumptions. One of the things that we agreed, and I, I spoke to uh, Mr. Veers uh, about, was the need for a policy in this area so that hopefully we can codify exactly how this board goes about setting premiums, how we go about returning any money to uh, employees, and putting that in place so that there's a consistent methodology to uh, th that would follow. Uh, what Mr. Veers did indicate uh, to me when we spoke was that he was open to looking at this in January and making adjustments even mid-year if we saw, you know, rates or if we saw a claims experience going either in a tremendously favorable or tremendously unfavorable direction. And, and I think that's an important uh, distinction or important 
offer, if you will, on the part of the SEA, because what that gives us is flexibility to start a dialogue and talk about what does that policy look like, and it also gives us an opportunity to recognize that these rates may not necessarily be the rates that we need to have for the entire 2018-19 school year. So we're going to work and collaborate on a policy, uh, not only with the Serval Education Association, but through our Health Benefits Committee with all of uh, our employee units to uh, come up with a way to codify how we go about doing this methodically and consistently. And then depending on what that codification reveals in working with our broker, we can then look to uh, adjust the rates as necessary. Thank you. Um, can I, I just would like to respond because um, I, you might misunderstand why I was voting now. These rates for next year, I'm not objectionable to the rates for next year. The reason that I had wanted them lowered was because these rates do not take into account the over collection from last year, which is why the health care committee had originally wanted to lower the rates to reflect that savings that we had from last year. So I just want to make it clear it's not I'm not objecting to next year's rate. I'm objecting that it was there were no nothing reflected in there for the over collections from last year. Okay. And to that point, we still we haven't completed this year yet, so we don't know if we have an overcollection or not. Yeah, we did. We did. We, we only have a couple well, months. Well, we do as of today, but we don't know for the balance of the year. Right, but it's very consistent from month to month, the overcollection. It's clear the way the pattern was going. Uh, Ms. Hill, number 14 also for me. And I have a question on number 24, uh, the assistant BA. Is that part of her contract that she attends these? Uh, it is. It's part of her contract? Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, moving forward to student achievement. Numbers one through seven, we have uh, co-curricular activities and trips for you to prove, including but not limited to the attendance of two SAMHSA upper elementary school students who we're incredibly proud of. They're fifth grade students, Nicholas Bellotti and Joshua Vermer, um, who at the regional history be advanced, uh, and they'll now be participating in the national History B, which will be held on May 31st to June 1st, 2018. Uh, their parents are picking up the expenses, but um, we're approving that trip, and we are recognizing and honoring them for this amazing accomplishment. So they will be representing Sayreville in the Nationals uh, on May 31st to June 1st. And also on Friday, June 8th, 2018, approximately 100 Sayreville High School students are going to the middle school to talk to our students at the middle school about the different clubs and activities they can participate here uh, at the high school in, uh, which I think is a great idea. We've been doing it now for several years. Uh, I think that the more we can get kids engaged in the total school program, um, the more academic success we can promote for them. So the fact that we're sending kids over there to talk up the various different clubs, activities, and athletic programs that our kids can participate in, I think is a wonderful idea and a wonderful program. Any questions on student achievement or comments? Seeing none, I'll move to governance. In governance, we're asking you to approve the job description revision of the confidential secretary for the School Business Administrator Board Secretary. We're also asking you to approve uh, for Mr. Walsh to continue his excellent job as being our representative on the assembly uh, for the Educational Services Commission of New Jersey. Um, that will be from June 1st, 2018 through May 31st of 2019. You can find that on page 16. And then finally, number four, we're asking you to approve the second and final reading of the Superintendent's Advisory Council, as well as the Advertising sport, uh, Sponsorship and Commercial Activities <coughs> Policies. And you might also note, too, that we had another ad that we're asking you to approve. So we formally have three ads now on our website. We just put together a program with um, school revenue partners in which now we're going to create a separate package to uh, Bomber Blast advertisements, as well as to include advertisements on Bomber Blasts, which will naturally increase the amount of revenue we're producing through advertising. Any questions on Vision 2030 governance? Question. The school revenue company that you just mentioned, yes. what's the, um, how do they get paid? They take a portion of the advertising revenue. And is it a percentage? Or yes. It is, yeah. Do you I know what it is? I don't oh, recall the exact number. Yeah. I want to say it's like 30%. I think so, but I can look right now and find out. <clears throat> it's around 30%. Well, they collect the money, take their share and give it to us, or we collect the money and they bill, they bill us for They. They collect it and give us our share.
Well, Ms. Hill is looking that up, if you don't mind. Uh, if there are any other questions, I can entertain them, or I can move on to personnel, and then I, I'm sure that she'll follow up uh, when she finds that information. Could, could you just tell us, like, how much that costs? Like, how much does that cost in the company to put that, that ad on, like the one you – I don't have the actual rates in front of me. I know that um, a year-long ad on our website anywhere between three to five thousand dollars. And they would get maybe thirty. Now, when you include the bomber blast as well as the ads in the bomber blast, you can increase it by about two thousand dollars. So we could potentially ad. get about five to seven thousand dollars a year, and we sell them by the year. Any other questions on that? No, I'll move on to personnel. <clears throat> Number one, it's one of those bittersweet moments that we're asking you to accept the retirement of a beloved staff member. In this particular case, it's George Najar, a physical education and health teacher at the Eisenhower Elementary School. Uh, and of course, George was um, a football coach here and is a Hall of Fame, New Jersey Hall of Fame football coach. On the occasion of your retirement, we all take the honor of thanking you for your tireless performance and dedication to the children of Sayreville. During the past 24 years, George Najar, efforts on and off the athletic fields, puts him in an elite status within the community. For 20 plus years, he served the children of Sayreville at Sayreville War Memorial High School, and for the past four years at the Eisenhower Elementary School. Commitment and character have been his hallmark and his absence will be felt by all. Rarely do we get to see a person like George Najar with a unique combination of vision, enthusiasm, and passion for children. Under his tutelage and guidance, many young minds have bloomed, and he has shown them the way to success in their adult lives. Over the years, he's been an asset to this school district as a teacher, mentor, advisor, and as a football coach. Therefore, on behalf of the Sayreville Board of Education, it is now our time to say thank you to Mr. Najar for all that he's done for the children of Sayreville. Congratulations, Mr. Najar, for a job well done and a well-deserved retirement. Also on the agenda, you'll notice that um, we are losing one of our administrators, Mr. Rubino. Uh, I'd like to personally First of all, congratulate Mr. Rubino uh, for being appointed several weeks, about, uh, weeks ago to be the new principal of the Spotswood, of Spotswood High School. I am so thrilled for him and his family. I think the Spotswood School District did an excellent job in finding an incredibly talented educational leader. And he too will be sorely missed. Uh, he has made a profound impact on the culture and the academics here at the high school. And I know, speaking on behalf of Mr. Brown, that he is sorely going to Mr. Re miss Mr. Rubino. However, I've also talked to many of our staff members at the high school and many of our parents of students from the high school, and they too will sorely miss Mr. Rubino. Uh, moving along, numbers 8 and 9, as well as 22 through 24, we're asking you to approve um, New hired, uh, to hire new certificated and non-certificated staff for the 2017-18 as well as the 2018-19 school year. You can find all of that on pages 18 and 19 and the addendum. Numbers 10 through 12, we're asking you to approve uh, advisors, coaches, and volunteer coaches for the 2018-19 school year. You can find all of that on pages 21 through 24. Numbers 16 through 17, we're asking you to approve the renewal uh, to approval to renew the employment of certificated and professional staff for the 2018-19 school year. That does not count administrators. Um, that is all our certificated instructional and non-instructional staff, as well as our professional staff. And then finally, number 27, which can be found in the addendum, we're asking you to appoint personnel to work during the summer enrichment program, uh, which just like Camp Excel, will be held from July 2nd through August 10th uh, this summer. Are there any questions or comments with regard to Vision 2030 personnel? And before we do that, Ms. Hill, did you find that information? So we receive 35% of the revenue, not the profit. So all of their overhead co costs come out of their percentage. 
and not ours. New so for yeah. yeah, so for a thousand dollars, that if they sell ad space for a thousand dollars, we would get three hundred and fifty. Okay, so we get the thirty. We get the thirty-five. Yeah. Oh, we get the thirty-five. And we they, get the 35. they pick up the overhead. Okay. They pick up all the overhead costs. Mm -hmm. A number. Qu a general question about the substitutes. The uh, substitute teachers. And I know I think I asked this last year because I always hear that our substitute pay is low. Um, do, did we do, do we do a comparison of what other districts are paying? I actually just recently did a comparison and uh, we are in the above average category okay, and with, the other count, with the other school districts in Middlesex County. Okay. Um, I also been hearing the rumor that we're looking, are you looking to privatize the substitutes? Or? No. No. Um, what, right now our sub. When you talk about substitutes, the most important thing you talk about is fill rate. The number, the percentage of absences that are filled that need to be filled. Right now, we're right around the 80% mark. Um, we really would like to be above 90%. So what we are looking to do, and we've been talking about it all year, is um, contracting with a supplemental service that will help us fill that extra 10 to 15 percent so that we can fill as close to 100 percent of the absences that need to be filled. That's what we're looking to do. After our pools exert. Yes. Yep. So it won't impact our current substitutes who no. come all the time. In fact, if you've noticed on the past several agendas, um, Dr. Agalese and our Human Resources Department continues to interview and appoint and ask you to appoint um, substitutes. I would say at a half a dozen an agenda, we're asking you to approve them. Um, right now, we have a large staff, um, a large pool of substitutes. However, like I said, despite our large pool, um, many of them are not taking the jobs that, um, that we need them to take. And there are specific types of jobs that we have a very difficult time filling. Um, for instance, paraprofessional jobs. And some of our self-contained special education um, vacancies, we have a tough time. So that's why we feel that we need a supplemental service that after we've exhausted our pool, they come in and they fill those spots with their pool. And what would that cost? Do we pay the same or? Um, it, it's going to cost us. It, 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 it all depends upon, we, we finally figured out that we probably would have to go out to bid for those services. Um, so we've already been using a service right now to fill our nursing vacancy. Um, so there are several different vendors that are out there and one of the things that we'll probably do over the summer is port, uh, put that out to bid so that we can find, um, you know, the lowest bidder, but the service that we feel is going to provide us with that supplemental substitute services that we need. So will they, so they pay the substitute teacher and we pay them? Correct. So do you know what they pay their substitutes or is it? They, I, I've used them in okay. previous jobs. They typically pay whatever you want to pay them. Okay. So you would use your own rates. And then the additional amount that they would bill you is typically their fee or any taxes they have to pay and a filling fee or something of that nature. And many of our substitutes are already part of these companies. Um, they are actually, many of our substitutes are part of several, they might be employees for several different um, vendors. So we are picking from the same pool too. Um, but many of these companies, um, you know, provide language in their contracts that, um, you know, pretty much guarantee that they'll provide us with a certain fill rate that we need. And again, we're able to fill about 80%, um, but we feel that that's not enough. We would like to be up into the 90s. Is there a shortage or? You know There's a teacher shortage that? right now, yes. And a that's, that impacts shortage. substitutes. Um, so right now there is a pretty significant teacher shortage. Um, therefore, um, we have a shortage of substitutes. Any other questions on the superintendent's report? On, on items 10, 11, and 12, most of them are employees. But if they're not employees, do they have any background checks they go through? Everyone has a background they, even check. Even if they're not employees. No one is brought up to your attention for approval unless they've um, successfully completed their background check. And on number 16, I'm going to abstain on Vicki Kilpatrick. And on number 17, I'm going to abstain on Amy Lembo. That was number 17? 17 is Amy Lembo, 16 is Vicki Kilpatrick. Thank you. Any other comments on the superintendent's report? Uh, just three things. Uh, Mrs. Backo, first of all, a question. When we come up with the policy on the prescription, what reduction are you looking for for next year? What 
reduction was I looking for? Yeah, well, what's the output that you're looking for? Well, we had originally discussed it at the meeting, and this was five. I had suggested a 15, so it would have been 10 more. But that would have been a reduction in the rates. It didn't take into account if we were going to refund money. Right. So it would be two separate issues. So it, I can't look at one without the other. All right, so straight reduction. If we did a straight reduction, you're looking at 15. I was looking at 15, yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Uh, the other two comments that I wanted to make, first of all, congratulations to Mr. Rubino. Um, I think he's been an outstanding vice principal here. I believe that we uh, actually stole him from Spotswood, uh, and now Spotswood is taking him back. Uh, but I know that he's going to go on to be a, uh, a great principal. He's been a great vice principal for us and uh, really embodied the culture of uh, Cerebral War Memorial High School. Um, and Dr. Labby, also to your comments, I would also like to uh, recognize and thank uh, Coach Najar as well. Um, I know when you think about Coach Najar, you typically only think about one thing, but the bottom line is he's had a tremendous legacy here in Cerebral and has helped a tremendous number of kids for over many, many years. And I really want to recognize Coach Najar for uh, the work that he's done and this commitment to Cerebral. Absolutely. Any other comments? Uh, we'll do that later. Uh, at this time, I'll open it up to public on uh, any, I, I'm sorry, on the superintendent's report. Okay, hearing none, we'll close public at this time. I'll entertain a motion to approve the superintendent's report. So moved. Second. By Mr. Mrs. Bloom, second by Mr. Walsh. Any comments on the superintendent's report? Roll call, please. Mr. Balka? Yes, with items noted. Mrs. Bacco? Yes, with items noted. Mr. Bichotta? Yes, with items noted. Mrs. Bloom? Oh. Yes. I forgot to mention Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I made an error. Um, we talked about it in closed, um, but we do need to withdraw number seven. I apologize that from personnel. I failed to note that in my superintendent's report. Um, so if we could just back up for a second. It says withdrawn. Personnel. It says withdrawn. It does say withdrawn on the agenda. Withdrawn. Okay. okay. Then they, she, okay. Changed, she changed it for you on your copy, but um, just to know publicly, number seven on personnel has been withdrawn. I apologize. What page is that? And for the benefit of the uh, public, that is a, the food services uh, director, yeah. uh, and that individual has withdrawn their name from consideration, which is why we're not appointing them. Uh, Mr. Callahan? Uh, yes. Mr. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Rubio? Yes, with exceptions noted. Mr. Walsh? Yes. Mr. Sayak? Yes. Okay, moving on to the delegate to the New Jersey School Boards Association, a uh, few items. Uh, first of all, I sent out uh, to you today the two resolutions, one dealing with uh, school funding and the money following the child, and the other one dealing with school safety. Uh, I wanted to know from the board if you're okay with those two resolutions and that on behalf of Cerebral, I should support them. Does anyone have any objections? I object to the uh, assault weapon ban. Well, I, we're going to get to that in one second, because that's, that's, not, that's not what the resolution says, but I do need board direction on that one as well. So everyone's okay with the resolutions so that were. If it wasn't the assault one, which one is it? Just, just the no, I, so, no, the two resolutions, one dealt with funding, one dealt just generically with school safety okay. and you know, criminal background checks to purchase firearms, et cetera. Okay. So those two resolutions the board supports. The other question from what I hear, and I don't know if this is going to come up from the floor as an amendment, but from what I've heard it may, uh, is that an amendment would be proposed that NJSBA would oppose all assault weapons as an organization, that they believe that assault weapons should be banned. I would need direction from Cerebral with regard to how I should vote should that amendment come up. I don't know that it will. It may not. But if it does, I don't want to be sitting there saying I'm not sure how the board feels about this. So discussion. Mr. Bashada, obviously. Yes, uh, well, I'm a gun owner. And uh, I object to the idea of the Second Amendment being taken away from individuals. If you remember when our forefathers set up to make the Second Amendment, they always said about an armed militia in ta case of government takeover. Uh, even though we do have a registered militia here in the state of New Jersey, uh, such as the National Guard, etc. It's still the right of everyone to own, according to the Constitution of the United States, to own weapons, guns, no matter what type they are. The, as New Jersey has one of the strictest gun control laws in the United States, 
the issue that's brought up here is that the guns that are brought into New Jersey illegally. That's the issue. It's not respectable owners that are known and, and know how to operate a weapon. It's the illegal weapons. If you want to make a pitch, make a pitch to enforcement of out-of-state guns coming into this into our state and being used to commit crimes. That's the issue that, that's facing us. It's not someone that is trained and knows how to use a weapon. The issue is, is that the perpetrators receive or buy, well, there was just an example of a gentleman from, well, let me, not a gentleman, an individual, we'll say, from Pennsylvania in Bergen County was selling AR-15s and uh, AK-47s to make a profit with no registration or anything on it. That person should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. If I was to purchase a gun, I have my firearms ID, I have to get a permit, I go through a background check, a fingerprinting check, mental health check, everything else, and, I, and if I pass it, which I do, I'm allowed to purchase a weapon. And I, I can't see taking that right away if one individual wants to have an assault rifle. Okay. Other comments? I don't think anybody needs an assault weapon. That is my opinion. I am not against people who own guns. If you're a hunter, that's fine. I do not believe that anyone who is not in the military or in the police needs an assault weapon. And I believe that every assault weapon that was used in any of these school shootings was purchased legally. So it's not helping. Okay. What is the uh, New Jersey School Board trying to do with this position? Are they... Th this would be their, 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 their position, position for advocacy. For so, for example, if there was legislation that was introduced banning assault weapons, it would be legislation that NJSBA would support. Is this for New Jersey? This is for New Jersey. This is for New Jersey. So I have to record a vote for several. This isn't just me as a you know, right, national no, business. I, know. I, I have to record. The way you said it, if they were looking to take it outside Jersey. Well, I mean, they, again, if, if congressional legislation were to come up, you know, NJSBA advocates federally as well, so they would take that outside of New Jersey as well. But it's the position of just the New Jersey School Board Association. Now, Tom, can you legally own an assault rifle in New Jersey? Can you own one? Can you legally own one? Yes. Right? You can. Okay. If you go down to the Did sportsman the down here on the corner of Journey Mill Road, Washington Road, present your ID card, They'll do, they'll do a background check on you, a federal check within a matter of hours, and you can legally purchase that weapon. Anyone else? Comments? I, I'm just torn because we obviously all have different personal beliefs on, on uh, you know, weapons in school and weapons in general. I, I agree with Tom that there's a Second Amendment right, but I also agree, like the Supreme Court decided, that there are limits on the types of guns you own. I just think we're falling kind of into the same danger we agreed as a board last time that we didn't think a board should take a position on this. And I'm not sure we should take a position with them either. And, and that's where I'm conflicted with this because whatever my personal belief or Tom's personal belief is, I'm not sure that, you know, that's going to reflect the community or reflect what, you know, we, that we can encapsulate what the town of Sarable thinks or, or, or should, you know, you know necessarily. And, and look, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's one of the debates that's issued on the floor in terms of, look, is the New Jersey School Boards Association the best organization with the expertise to take a position on this? Yeah. So, and, and you're right. I mean, you're, I'm not asking you necessarily for your personal opinion. I'm asking you what position should Cerville take on this matter? Or should we simply say we're not taking any position? I'm with John. Um, when, when we talked about the school walkout, we didn't take a position there, right, in, in a sense. Same way here. I don't think this is our fight to, uh, to wage. I think we should stay out of it personally. And I agree with Anthony and John. I also do. I think we should abstain from it. So what would you do for a vote if we take no position? You just I would abstain. You just would abstain. Yeah. I would not vote. vote. What is that, though? But is that a no vote? That, that, no, it would be an abstention. It would not count. So Abstentions do not count at a delegate assembly. Okay. So it would be like I wasn't even there. But you said it was an amendment, the way I read that. It's an amendment to that one resolution. It is an amendment which may be offered by, a, by an individual school district. To the resolution. To the resolution. Seen. So by abstaining, we're not going to support that other part. No, what I would do is I would abstain on the amendment. Only on the amendment. If the amendment becomes part of the resolution, I would then vote no. If the amendment becomes part of the resolution, I would then abstain on the resolution as well. If it does not become part of the resolution, I would support the existing resolution. Is that the direction we want to take? Yes. Okay. I'm glad we had the discussion. 
Uh, and then also, uh, Mrs. Bloom, I believe uh, you and I have some presentations to uh, Mr. Bashada and to Mr. Esposito. Yes, we do. Uh, last week I attended the Middlesex County uh, School Board meeting, and Anthony and uh, Tom were not able to attend, but Mr. Esposito was awarded the new board member certification, which means he has accrued 10 credits uh, of training, at least one done in person, so I will present to you. Actually, what we'll do is we can go out front and we'll do a, oh. Dr. Labby can take a photo and we'll do a. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Most want to this is what happens card. when you miss the meeting. Yes. This is what Dave, I got mine. So I do I have to go up now? We'll get you. We'll go. Do I have to get up? Good enough. We'll have to get up eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I'll enjoy this. <laughs> okay, and Mr. Bashada. This is working. I don't think so. Something's wrong, but it's okay. Uh, Dr. Labby spoke about uh, Spiesel and the $66,000 uh, they want to charge for an overall assessment. We thought uh, that was a good idea considering the referendum that we're looking to put forth. Uh, Spiesel recommended okay, that we do this in September of 2019. Okay? What that'll do is it'll allow them uh, an opportunity to complete the ass assessment and present to us uh, sometime in September. Next couple of months, they'll have it ready for us. Is that right, Aaron? Yes. They'll be pretty quick with that. <clears throat> uh, they're also going to assist us with the community outreach, which we think is extremely important. Educate the community on what exactly we're spending all this money on. And uh, the whole process takes about six months. And some of the things we're looking to do, uh, I think we've talked about it here, air conditioning, window, security up, uh, upgrades. Uh, we're looking into solar energy as well as a possibility and um, we're looking to do this varsity baseball field, fix this thing once and for all. Uh, Dr. Labby also spoke about the football field. We know the number is uh, 419,000 to fix the field. Uh, it looks beautiful. I don't know if anybody has seen the pictures. Did those pictures come out? Did you send those? I believe I did include they're, they're, yes. It's gorgeous. It should be beautiful. Uh, we also received a letter from a nice woman who lives behind Truman School. Apparently our trees are extending into her yard and causing an issue, so uh, Jimmy's going to get some prices and quotes to see if we can get that trimmed back. It, I think it's several thousand dollars to get the tree removed, so we're not going that route. We're just going to trim that tree for her. Uh, we also replaced the water heater, or well, the water heater is being installed, right? Did we do that yet at the high school, Jim? Yeah. be complete. Right. Great. Uh, we talked about the interview situation. I won't go into there any further. Uh, 
And that's it. I think the fund balance, I'm going to uh, defer this to Ms. Hill, if you want to speak to it a little bit. Uh, sure. The fund balance estimate that I included with the Finance Committee summary is uh, preliminary. It's through the financials through the end of March. So we're still reconciling April. And once that's done, I can provide something a little bit uh, more clear because then we'll be a little bit closer to the end of the year. But as of right now, um, we have the funds that we need to put into fund balance for next school year and the year after that that we need, as well as looks like a million dollars to put in reserves. And a million dollars for what? To put in reserves. Like capital I had, when I was reading that, I saw that there was two million. Right. So that's just, um, and I don't know if any of the board members that were there want to speak to it a little bit more. But we don't necessarily. It doesn't mean we have to put that amount in. It doesn't mean that we're going to have that amount to put in. But in the event that we do, like last year, the auditors found some other things that um, w enabled us. We could have put more money into reserves, but we only but board approved up to a million, so we couldn't. So what we talked about was approving up to, I think, a million each for the maintenance and the capital reserves. But we did not plan on having $2 million. We just wanted the flexibility at the time in which the, the you know, final financials were available to be able to allocate between the two of them. So it's a cap. It's a max. I thought it's a $2 million and $1 million. Um, I thought that's what we discussed, one? but maybe, that, maybe I was incorrect and my notes may have been wrong. It was $3 million okay. in total. That, really and I think that's what my notes said, but I don't know if that could have been incorrect. So. I'll check. I don't want to bring them with yeah. me, but I can so check mine. So that would be on the board, the board yeah, agenda in June. Yeah. So. Right, but if you're looking to um, transfer or up to three million dollars, what is your estimate that you think you're going to have? Right now, it's at a million. It's only one million. Yes. But our thought process was it doesn't hurt us to have more flexibility. It right. does hurt us to set it at a million dollars and come in at a million two. And what was the number last year? Uh, we board approved million. up to a million dollars. No, no, in what was the real number? Million. It was a million we put in capital reserve. Right, but what was the number that you could have put in? If we um, had well, we more? had we had more in reserves. It was maybe another three hundred thousand dollars that ended up going to excess surplus, which in a way it helped us in the current year because I didn't need as much to fall out of the seventeen eighteen budget to fund the eighteen nineteen budget. So when are you going to have a real number? Probably August. Not till August. Right. And so we have to board approve this in June. So this is just my preliminary estimates. And do you have an estimate for what you think the number is going to be? That's I right mean, now there's it's a big at a difference million. between a million and two million. So if you're if you're looking to uh, it was a million, do a million. up to a million, a million well, it was three million in total. No, no, but the estimate's a million. Right. The estimate right now is at a million. Right. right. So you want to vote to put away three million, up to three million, but you're only estimating that we have a million. At the moment, yes. At the moment. So, so what, what's the harm in setting a higher cap knowing that the board can still come back and finalize the number? Because once you put it there, well, first of all, because one of them is a maintenance reserve. It's, it's a number that we've never had before, and I think a million dollars is high. And that money could be used to offset next year's budget. And it, and it can be for maintenance expenses in next year's budget. That's, that's the, kind of the thought process behind the committee. Right, but that's a lot. A million dollars is a lot. Suppose you wanted it for something else that wasn't maintenance. I mean, this is a, a, a number that we've never had before, and all of a sudden we want to put away a million dollars. I think that's a high number from, from zero. And, and again, it's a cap. No one's saying we want to put away a million dollars. It is a cap. Right. We're just saying we can put up to a million. Right. Right. We're not going to handcuff ourselves to say we can only right. put... So how it. does, if the number is lower, how does that process... We just put in the lower amount. That's it. That's it. And does that come up on a board report? No, it would be in the audit when the audit's finalized. All right. So if the board does, the board vote up to a number. Yes. Right. So in June, the board would say vote up to this three million dollars that you want to put away in a reserve. And if it's not three million, if the number, where does that? lower number how does that number get determined the finance committee didn't they do in the past yeah it was a conversation with the finance committee we work with the auditors in my office and I we come up with the amount that it is I look at how much we need to have in our surplus in order to continue to fund our budget so it never comes forward. back to the public that number I, I don't know what you mean like the for a vote yeah the final right. so it the comes never... back in the audit so then it's seen in the audit but there's not another vote on it just She's the audit. referring for tax purposes Right. So, in other words, if you want to put this million dollars in this maintenance reserve that we've never had before, and then you say, okay, we don't have a million, we only have 800, you only want to put 800,000, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. How does anybody know it's it's, it's in, in an the audit, audit report? I mean, how, that never comes back to the public how much money you used. It's in the audit, and the auditors come and do a presentation, and they present that. Yeah. Well, this was the first year we've ever had an audit presentation, and I highly doubt that number was very clear to anybody um, based on that presentation. Well, look, if, if the board wants, we can set a stipulation that you're going to come back to us with a final recommendation. I mean, that, that's... There just there can't be another vote on it because the financials end June thirtieth. The vote has to be before June thirtieth. Right, right. And that's I understand required. That. I understand that, but so. I was just looking for beyond June thirtieth how this works because I think I just think that a million is a lot. You're looking at three million. Do you have any you know idea that we have an extra three million dollars? Not at this moment. No, it's just a like Mr. Simon I mean, said a cap. Look the, the way I and I'll put this in real person terms for the uh, for, you know for the, for the public. When I went to buy my car, I went and I I got a loan. Well, I went to PNC Bank and I got a ready loan, and they said, "Well, how much are you looking to spend?" And I said, "I uh, I don't know." And I said, "You know what? How much can I get approved for?" They said, sixty thousand dollars." I said, "Okay, give me a loan for sixty thousand dollars and let me write the check for whatever I need to use." I didn't buy a sixty thousand dollar vehicle and borrow sixty thousand dollars, but I had the capability and flexibility to do. What I needed. Right. That's what this right. is. But you don't have the same flexibility here because you're going to put a million dollars in a maintenance reserve. Suppose we want to change the curriculum. We can't use that money. Again, right? it's up to a million right. dollars. But that number never we, comes back. It's just arbitrary. Okay. And you see it in a report. So it's just up to a million. Well, the, the item will be on the board agenda on the, in June and the board can then approve that's, it or reject yeah. it. That's correct. And we could, in that year, if we needed to put more money towards something else, we can use the money in re maintenance reserve to just fund the maintenance budget. So if there was a one-time expenditure, you can still do it. You can use it for anything in the maintenance budget. So granted, you couldn't apply it directly to curriculum, but if you save a million dollars in the maintenance budget that year, you can apply that million dollars elsewhere. And it doesn't create a revenue hole that way. Mr. Syak. Yes, Mr. On the, this maintenance item that we're talking about right now, Mrs. Batko brought up, is that a protected amount of money that if we have another Christie incident that they can come and raid? I know in the Capital Reserve, the state cannot touch it. Is this a similar shelled Good. type of uh, money that the the state can't take. Good question, Mrs. Miss Hill. Do you, do you understand what the question is? I do, um, and I don't. I don't know of any time that they've ever taken money out of the reserves from districts. I know that that was a threat at some point, but um, you know, in statute, we are allowed to have money in the maintenance reserve. We're actually allowed to have up to almost six million dollars in our maintenance reserve, and we have a thousand and four dollars in our maintenance reserve. So um, I've heard nothing as far as that happening. But if that were to come up then you would be able to withdraw the money to use it for maintenance items if you were worried about that. And Ms. Hill, when Christie did that you know, eight years ago, the, the, the maintenance reserve at that time fell under the same auspices as the capital reserve. It was not touched. Right. Okay. But I so, do recall when we discussed that the last time, too, when they took that money, that the governor has the authority. He could just, he could have it. taken it well, if you can take it out of maintenance, you can take it out of capital. Yeah, so it, take it. Like, so I don't know. We're I'm, only going on a pass. It might be a little bit more protected, but I don't think we're protected. Well, I'm just looking at the aspect of having it protected. Like capital, they can't touch. No, no they, they, they can. I, think I if thought the it was the reverse. Can we look it. into that? I thought the maintenance is the one they couldn't touch, and capital, they could. I no, think no, it's, it's pretty it's much the same. The I think they're both. Yeah. And I really both? doubt this governor yeah. will be taking money from our reserves. I don't think this governor is going to take money from anybody. Never know. Any other uh, committee reports? Uh, I have board of directors. Board of directors, New Jersey school boards. New Jersey school boards, board of directors, um, the new video conferencing capability, the major goal of New Jersey school boards strategic plan focuses on building a future ready association and the strategic plan calls for school boards to lead by example. While providing local schools with strategies and resources to advance digital learning and become future ready. New Jersey School Board's governance and operations policy, which applies to the Board of Directors meetings, permits remote access voting, and the association has also updated corresponding regulations to reflect remote participation. This is all made possible by a generous donation by the Cisco Systems and the conferencing equipment is valued at over $200,000. Also contributing is SHI, which is a global solutions provider based in Somerset, New Jersey. 
School Security. The School Security Committee met in April and is now in the process of updating New Jersey's 2014 report, What Makes Schools Safe? So that new report will be out in June. STEAM education. New Jersey School Boards continues to work with the U.S. Army to advance STEAM education. Uh, discussion to replicate the New Jersey School Board and U.S. Army STEAM Education Partnership in other states is ongoing. And New Jersey is honored to, um, I'm sorry, New Jersey School Boards will be honored for its work to advance STEAM education. The association will receive the Impact Award from New Jersey Technology and Engineering Education Association. So we're moving forward with technology. Thank you, Mrs. Bloom. Mr. Uh, we, Mr. Syak and myself participated in that video conferencing with the school boards. Um, it was a wonderful event, and it's a wonderful technology that they have there. Um, so they, they didn't make me any taller, though, John. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I'll agree with that. I mean, I, 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 participate, <laughs> I participated in that board meeting remotely from my house on Friday night, and uh, not only did I not have to drive to Trenton, they didn't need to feed me. There was no mileage reimbursement, so it saved the association money, and I got to do it from home. So it was really, really good. And it was just like I was there. There was no difference. Any other uh, comments or discussion? I have a... Uh, uh, the security committee met. Oh, did, oh security, sure, security met. Security met. We did. Thank you. Thank you. I forgot about that myself. Uh, okay. So we had a, a really good meeting. Um, I don't know how much I can really discuss at this point, but I will tell you this. For those who don't know at this point, we are doing a pilot program with the police department in town, and they are giving us officers with six hours a day, and basically our, in our elementary schools, and we have our SRO officers in the middle school and high school full-time. Full that hasn't changed. And the feedback so far is amazing. Everything, the, the kids, the students are have, loving it. Uh, the police are engaging. They're, uh, the principals are real happy. The staff is happy. Uh, everyone feels safe. And uh, so far, it's really been successful. Uh, we, uh, we have to have further discussions in the next uh, month or so on moving forward uh, and how we're going to implement this strategy coming in September. There's a few things we have to iron out that I won't discuss now, but we'll bring to your attention as soon as we, uh, we go over them. So uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that. Nothing? Uh, you had a student presentation, too. I don't know if you yeah. can comment on what the student shared. Uh, yeah. If you can't, uh, that's fine. I don't know. I don't know how much we can. Do you think we could discuss the content? Or just, I wasn't there, so I don't know what was shared. You want to? I don't mind. Um, don't mind? Okay. okay. We had a, <laughs> show we could do that a high school of. senior, Gabriella Dano, mm -hmm. um, who uh, was accompanied by her father, and she gave an incredible presentation to us, um, basically recommending several different things um, from um, particular um, blankets that repel uh, ammunitions and so forth to door stoppers and uh, several other ideas how we can protect our students in our schools. So uh, she put together a tremendous amount of um, research and made a very succinct um, but poignant presentation to all of us. And we were all incredibly impressed and appreciative. Could you uh, forward that presentation to the board? I think you said she did a PowerPoint? Sure, yes. That'd be great. Oh, she, yeah, she did a phenomenal job. She did, she did a great job. Uh, one other item that we discussed was, uh, was our drills. So we, I always ask, and we always ask about the current drills, if they're, if they're working, if there's anything new. And uh, Dr. Labby had come up. I'm not going to discuss the details. I, I'll do so. I'd be happy to do so in closed session or, or privately about one of the new drills that we're going to be implementing uh, pretty soon, as a matter of fact. I'm, I'm on the distribution list. I will be witnessing the drill. It's an enhanced version of a lockdown. Let's just put it that way. And uh, I don't know if we can elaborate any further, Dr. Labby, or we just leave it there. I don't, I don't want to give too much away. Um, to no, I mean, we can, we can talk uh, in general about it. Um, you know, currently we drill when, we, when we're doing a security drill, particularly a lockdown drill. Um, you know, we might involve an evacuation. 
And what we want to do is we want to start making those drills as authentic as we can with regard to if, in fact, there was really an active shooter event, how would we go about evacuating? Uh, and it's far different than how we have been. Um, the other thing that we discussed is uh, a, a major um, part of that evacuation process, and that's the reunification with parents. And that being a, a very, very important in terms of everyone in the district understanding what their role is from the fire department in terms of what areas around the school are they going to shut down, uh, from the police department, how they're going to secure a perimeter, from the administration, how are we going to contact parents, what are we going to tell parents, how are we going to tell parents um, the procedure for reunifying with their children. So there's a lot to be done, and if you look at the different cases, um, unfortunately, many of the incidences, in many of the incidences, the school districts aren't prepared for the reunification process. And it usually results in a great deal of frustration, um, pain, um, and, and, and animosity, quite frankly. So the only way that, that we can potentially reduce any of that, and listen, that's going to come regardless, is for us to be able to have specific procedures in place. And then we don't necessarily have to drill them in person. We can just drill them what we call a tabletop drill, where we can perform it. Everybody knows their task, and we go through the task in a boardroom um, where we're able to move into the different phases of ending an event and taking our students to a place where they can safely reunify with their parents. So those are steps that um, I think that we have an idea of how we're going to do that, but I really think we have to iron out all those details and begin to practice them in a way that's not going to traumatize our kids and our staff members, but in a way that make sure that we can, um, as seamlessly as possible, um, be able to complete that process yeah. in a very high anxiety, high stressful moment. Right. But Mr. Preston and I discussed that earlier this evening. And he's, he's going to speak to his students and his personnel, the teachers, beforehand, just to give them an idea. Because it's, it's going to be different. And from what he tells me, if you, if you change the drill, some kids get you know, they're full of anxiety, you know. Yeah. They may think that something's really happening because it's not what they're used to, you know. So, well, we have to do that. But he's going to be very <laughs> delicate about it. Yeah. And he's meeting with the, I think he's meeting at the police academy in a week or two with uh, other principals, is it? I know he's uh, meeting with the police. To yes, go over the, all these the training drills and process, plans. yes. Yep. Okay. And uh, one other thing for me, I just want to, I don't believe I said this at the last board meeting because I didn't think we had all this in place, but I, <clears throat> I just want to say thank you to, to the to the borough council, um, and and the police department, our police department's amazing. I, I mean that sincerely. I really didn't know any of them before I got on this committee, and they just they just care so much, and they've done so much for us, and they want to continue to do so much for us. They actually thank us every meeting for inviting them. I mean, they just they're amazing, and I also want to thank Dr. Labby, because truthfully, without his support, we did, and I said this at a PTO meeting recently. <clears throat> I had an outline of how I thought this whole thing would play out. And, and, the, and the end result was to get to armed security in our schools. And I had a five to seven year plan. That was what I that was. And because Dr. Labby's support and the support in the community, we did it in two years. So I just want to thank you very much for and your if, help. And really. if I can add to that, Mr. Esposito, Fire Marshal Krasinski that's has right. also been a very important yeah, member correct. of our committee and has helped us out with a couple of different um, procedural changes. Um, right. that, that we, we've put into place. I, I also want to point out, too, that, um, you know, speaking of our police department, I put it in talk soup, um, Sarah Parent, uh, Parent, Sarahville Parent University will be hosting a workshop. Um, it'll be actually in the cafeteria here on May 22nd, and that workshop will be uh, on safety in our, and security in our schools, and it'll be presented by two Sarahville police officers who have had a great deal 
of, of participation on that committee. I think it's going to be Sar uh, Sergeant Sprague and Detective Elmire. Detective Sprague and Detective Elmire will be doing that presentation. And it's geared for parents, and it's geared for parents to understand the, the role of the police in shaping our security procedures and our drills. I know I'll be there, and I highly recommend um, you know, anyone in our public um, to, to go out and to listen to what um, our police department has to say and to ask every single question um, that, that may come to mind. They may not be able to answer all those questions, as Mr. Esposito has said before, um, but um, they, they will certainly try to address um, concerns and try to answer as many questions as, as they possibly are able to. Dr. Labby, I'd also encourage you, I, I love the direction you're going in, not only with, you know, sh better simulations of the, the different drills and more realistic simulations, but also, as you said, the, the, the reunification piece yeah, and what course. happens immediately after. The other thing that I've heard from other districts that have pitched out on this is it's not only the immediately after in terms of the reunification, it's what about the next 10 days? What about the next month? And not only even from a, like an active shooter situation, even a, a hurricane or some other natural disaster, some districts have been so overwhelmed by donations that they just weren't prepared to handle the outpouring of love and support from across the nation and how to administer that. Um, you know, do students go back to a particular school after an event like that in 30 days? If not, where? Uh, and I know that's the kind of the next, you're never done with this planning, no. but that's the, the kind of the next level after the reunification, but it's just something to, to keep in mind. No, and, and, and you're right, and that's the process we've taken under the leadership of Mr. Esposito with regard to this committee. We keep thinking of what else. We right. keep pushing forward, which I think is quite remarkable. Uh, have you heard any additional pushback or concerns regarding the graduation procedures? I know we got an email from um, one individual, uh, which I answered. Have you heard any other feedback regarding that? I, di I did not get any other feedback. Okay. All right. Any well, others? Do you, do you want to discuss that at all? The graduate, what we talked about as far as added security and... Yeah, you couldn't hurt. We're on TV. It couldn't hurt to mention it again. Um, well, well, basically to review what we discussed at our last board meeting, um, to which you um, approved a verbal motion. Um, we are not going to be permitting people to bring into graduation at the high school or the promotion ceremony for the middle school um, air horns, as well as any type of bag. Um, now, we're not talking about the, the, the handheld purses and things like that. We're talking about any bag in which um, you can put you know, multiple different types of objects into. Um, no bags at all will be permitted into graduation or promotion. I thought we said we weren't going to make a distinction between the size of the bag. We were just going to say no bags. That was that was my recollection as well. Well, I mean, I, I think you're getting into the semantics of the size of the bag. Pocketbook. Well, but so is it a but, pocketbook? Is it a clutch? So if this is if this is in like a protective in a purse, case, in a protective case, is it a bag? If it, I'm holding something like this and it's in a protective case, is that a bag? No, that's a cell phone. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, for instance, a, uh, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are men and women that carry a hand, you know, a about this, what is it? A wristlet. Whatever the case, <laughs> and, it, and it has either a cell phone in it or it has anything else in it. It's not a pocketbook. It's not a, a carry bag. Um, I thought we discussed the fact that um, that pocketbooks and bags were not going to be permitted, but if it's something that fits in your hand, a case. Like a camera permitted. case or? Yes. Okay. I mean, naturally, the purpose of not having a bag is, you know, for security purposes, we don't want anybody potentially to bring in a weapon. So something, you know, in a purse like this, you're not going to be able to fit a weapon in that. Um, so I, that's what I... That's what I interpreted from the resolution but or I from think the motion. The problem that you you're going to run into is then you're going to get into the semantics of size. Well, hers is this big, but mine is this big, but I'm still holding it in my hand. You know, you're going to have arguments going on at the gate if you say any kind of a purse can be brought in. So I mean, um, what? So again, for clarification purposes, I mean, these people aren't going to be able to carry anything in. Do you think the the people working the uh, security at it will have? Any problem with that distinguishing? Yeah, and I think that's the question. Can, I, I can you enforce it? You think they can enforce that? I'm, I, I'm I don't. I mean, 
You know, I mean, listen, asking people at a graduation not to bring in their cell phone um, or the case that they carry it, it in, it's kind of hard. Um, you know, again, I don't want to be, you know, gender oriented here, but I, I know that women don't wear, they don't put wallets in their back pocket. Uh, a woman puts their wallet, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in, in a purse-like thing. And usually, it, it can go into a pocketbook, right? But if, if not, you can have to be a handheld purse, like right. that, like Mrs. Bacco has. And has my car keys, my phone, and my money. I mean, that's going to be right. hard for a person not to, to, to tell a person a not to bring that in. a camera. Yeah. Yeah. You, can, can, you don't need to have the camera uh, in a case. You know, you, you can put it around your neck or hold it in your hand. So that, if it's obvious, it's a, it's a camera. 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 So that's what I'm saying. For something yeah. like that, I mean, I'm, I, I would think something like that, we can tell them that's permitted to bring in. Because if you wear a dress... As as long as you can right. communicate I mean, so it and enforce it. I'm trying to be it. sensitive. I, I want I want I want our students, our staff, and everyone that comes out to um, watch their children or grandchildren or siblings graduate. I want them to be safe first and foremost, but I don't also want to detract from the experience and the moment. So that's why I, I think that. You know, Phyllis said, a woman that comes in, you know, wearing a dress, well, where's she going to put her cell phone? A man might be able to slip it into his back pocket, but a woman's going to have to carry it. That might be a difficult thing to do. So I'm trying to think of everything here so that we can keep people safe but not detract from the experience and the memory. And, you know, electronics are part now of our society. I don't want to detract from that. I want to... Keep, keep people safe, but I also want people to be happy, too. All right, so it's a good discussion. I'm glad that individual emailed me. Uh, any other uh, questions or discussion on security first? And then, Mr. Bichotta, I'll get to you. Okay, Mr. Bichotta. Uh, what happened is at the last meeting, I discussed about the pay-to-play. I contacted Mrs. Batko, who was the chief negotiator, and Ms. Hill sent her the cost for the sports and the other extracurricular Cost that would be sports alone are six hundred thousand plus, and the extracurricular activities are eight hundred thousand dollars. Well, total it's two hundred thousand. It's eight hundred plus thousand dollars for the combined cost for extracurricular activities. That's why I had mentioned. You know, okay. one of the one of the issues is that it bothered me, and you're been involved with it was the ban. You know, we don't have the money to pay for the instruments that you know, like a trombone and some of these other horns are quite expensive. The point that I mentioned is with this, the pay to play, maybe some of this money that can be, I know the, the band parents raise for extracurricular activities, et cetera, but this would also help not only purchasing new equipment for them, but also taking a little bit of the burden out of the budget to have these people participate. I know band is a big thing in the middle school coming into the high school that's why I, I brought this up and with the amount of money that we're spending on extracurricular you know some extra help making this happen I think would be a benefit to all the students within the district and, and Miss Hill I think we'd ask that you send out the motion that we approved from the last from the meeting in which we talked about referring this I'm sorry, say that one more time. At, at the last meeting, we had asked you to send to the board the actual motion that we approved oh, with I regard apologize. to investigating uh, pay to play, just to ensure that what we have Ms. Badami investigating is exactly what the board wanted to investigate. Okay. If you could send that out to us sure. just to be sure. And thank you, Mr. Bishada, because that was supposed to be sent out and we just missed that one. Thank you. Um, and then once we get that, like I said, if there's any question on pay to play in terms of the direction that the board gave, we can clarify it at our next meeting, and then if not, we'll get the report from uh, the administration. Uh, anyone else for uh, items for discussion? Okay, hearing none, we'll open it up to public on any item concerning the district. She's holding back. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. DePinto. All right, at this time, at Mrs. DePinto's advice, we'll close public. <laughs> Uh, our next meeting is June 12th. We look forward to seeing you, and I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Mr. Bashada, do I have a second? Second. second. By Mr. Walsh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Carried. <laughs>